Hello, everybody, and welcome back to part two here. Um, answering questions six through 10 on exam two. As you can tell, I'm here at school and it's getting darker and darker. <laughs> Anyways, number six, we're up here. I got my pointer, so I won't be blocking it. I know it tries to focus on me, but I'm too close. Which is the following is true statement about experimental design. Replication, okay, key, key component, absolutely necessary, but it doesn't have to be done on repeated samples before generalizing the results. It could be done on one really large sample. So I have to have replication, meaning it has to be proven over and over again, but if I have a sample of, say, 500 people that I do it on, it's been replicated 500 times right there, as opposed to a small number and then doing the experiment over and over again with different groups, okay? So that, no, false. Okay, control is a key component, absolutely. Thus, a control group, okay, controlling variable is a very key component. That's different than a control group. A control group that receives a placebo is good when it works out that way. Sometimes we can't have a placebo if we are maybe exercising or not exercising. They know if they are or don't. There's no placebo there. It is definitely not a requirement, okay? It is not a requirement for all those problems. Okay, um, randomization is a key component to experimental design, all right? So it is used to reduce bias. That's a true statement, okay? Um, we're randomizing our people and applying them to the different treat or applying the different treatments to those groups, hoping that lurking variables, things like that, that we don't know about, are going to be best like dispersed throughout, so that we'll have the least effect on our experiment. Okay, so we want to reduce the bias. Okay, and blocking, we do that to eliminate lurking variables such as gender, like we block by women and men because there could be a difference in in the different genders there. But it certainly doesn't eliminate the effect of all lurking variables. There are often lurking variables we don't know about. We don't know if <clears throat> certain people had a good night's sleep before the experiment or not, things like that. So certainly can't eliminate all the lurking variables. And a placebo effect is a concern for all experiments? No, not if there's no placebo. Okay, we can talk about exercising or not, that would not be a concern. Okay, so um, C is the correct choice for number six. Number seven. <clears throat> okay, so experimenter believes two new exercise programs are more effective than any current exercise routines, wishes to compare the effectiveness of these two new exercise programs on physical fitness. The experimenter is trying to determine whether or not a control group which follows neither of the new programs but continues with current routines would be beneficial. Okay, which of the following could be said about the addition of a control group? Okay. Uh, control group would eliminate the placebo effect. Again, there's no placebo. They're doing one exercise routine or another, so that would not be the case in this problem. Um, a tr control group would eliminate the need for blinding. There's no need for blinding again. There's no way they're going to be blind to what they're doing. They're either exercising or not or doing this program or that program. There's no hiding that, okay? Um, <clears throat> a control group would allow the experimenter to determine which of the two exercise programs improves physical fitness the most. No, the t if I compare the two physical fitness routines, the new one together, I can see which one's better, okay? But the control group, hopefully the new ones are supposed to be better, will be better than the control group, right? But that won't tell, the control group won't tell which one of those is better, all right? Finally, here we are at D. A control group would allow the experiment to determine if either of the programs are more effective than current programs. Absolutely, that's the purpose of the control group, to get a baseline to see that your new things, that they're different or not. Okay, so that'll allow us to see if we actually have better programs there or not, comparing to the old. Okay, and then E is no added benefit, so D is the correct choice there. All right, number eight. Okay, all right, so eight is an interesting one here. Um, let's just see our problem here. So they're changing vendors for the toys, blah, blah, blah. The vendor claims that equal quantities of four types of toys have been manufactured will be distributed randomly among the restaurants. Okay, we don't expect everyone to get exactly the same amount of each toy, it's random, but Here's what the restaurant received, 89, 95, 106, and 110, and out of the 400 toys. Okay, we consider, if we consider it to be a random sample of toys, which is an important in our, one of our um, checks before we do any work, does this shipment provide sufficient evidence? That means you're conducting a test there when I say sufficient evidence, okay, to contradict the vendor's claim. 
Okay, so what they should be, what we expect is to have 100 of each of the four types of toys. Okay, this is a chi-squared goodness of fit test. All right, we're comparing 100 for each of those compared to what they really got and seeing if they're different or not. So let's have a look at that. Okay, so bring this up here. We are on number eight. Here we go. So our observations, we got 89 of one toy, 95, 106, and 110 of the other toys at the different stores. What we expected was an equal number. Okay, the total is 400 there, so we would have got 100 of each toy. Okay, all right, go on your calculator, put in chi-squared goodness of fit, or actually don't do that first. First of all, we put our observed values in column one. We enter that, okay, in our uh, list one. And then our expected values go in list two. And then if you go to a chi-squared goodness of fit test, all right, and it should have list two for your observed, list two for your expected, okay, and then it's gonna do run a test to see if they match or not. In the chi-squared goodness of fit test, the null is always at the new distribution. These guys here, our observed one, matches what we expect, matches the old one. They're you know, not significantly different. Okay, and then the alternative would be found that they do not match and we found something out interesting. Okay, if you run that test on your calculator, you should see a p-value of 0.3237. Okay, that is high. If it's low, we reject the hoe. It's a lie, high, excuse me. So we would fail to reject this, and, we, and then we would still be here. We don't have any reason to believe it's incorrect, okay? All right, our significant, <clears throat> well, sorry about that. Our findings here, <clears throat> since our p-value is high, are not significant. We did not find a significant difference, okay? So let's go back and see <clears throat> what our choices are, okay? Okay, so does the shipment convict, convict the contradict? Sorry, you know, I can't talk by now already, but I certainly can't tonight. Does the shipment provide sufficient evidence to contradict the vendor's claim? Okay, since the store did not receive 100, no, we don't expect them to get 100, but it should be pretty close, right? Not too far off. Okay, it says yes, since the, the significance, test of significance yields significant results. Okay, we did not get significant results. Okay, ours are 0.32. At the 0.1 level, that would be if it's less than 0.1, ours is point, I can't remember what it was, 0.42 or 0.3 something, it was high, I think it's 0.42. Again, we would not get significant results, okay? And let's see here. And again, we did not get significant results at the 0.01 or ours was not lower than those level, that's not significant. Okay, finally, E is correct, no, it did not contradict the vendor's claim because our test of significance yielded results that were not significant, even at the 0.1 level. Remember ours were, I think it was 0.42. Sorry, I have to check now. Oh, 0.32. Okay, so uh, 0.32 is certainly not lower to be significant than 0.1 are those levels, okay? So significant is lower than your alpha level. Those are our different alpha levels. Ours is higher than all of them. So not significant for any of those. So E, correct choice there. Number nine, okay, uh, here we go. Concert attendance for a stadium is normally distributed. Great, I can use normal CDF. All those kind of things can come into play already. Has a standard deviation of 7641. If a concert with 41,293 people in attendance is in the top 2% of all concert attendance, what's the mean? So let's go do the math on this one, okay? So what they've told us here, okay, is that 4, 41,293 equals the top 2%. Okay, so on our picture here, 41,293, that would be the top 2% up there. That would reach that level, okay? Now, our mean, we don't know. We know the standard deviation is 7,641. So what we're going to do is use our z-scores to figure this out. Um, and here we go. So first of all, we're going to find the z-score for the top 2% on a z-distribution because I don't know the mean here. I can't find out like what that is from this problem. But on a Z distribution, I can find anything out because I already know the mean is zero and the standard deviation one. So go to inverse norm. Remember that inverse norm, you have to put in the area to the left of what you're looking for. I want to find this place that 2% is above it. That means 98% below. So I will put in 0.98. 
the mean is zero and the standard deviation one, again, for all Z distributions, that's true. That gives me a Z score of 2.05. All right, and I'm gonna plug that in my Z score formula. All right, so 2.05 equals what I got in my problem minus the mean, what it should be over the standard deviation. I got this in my problem to work with, and that I can have a Z score of 2.05 and 7641 is the standard deviation, and I'm gonna calculate the value of the mean. I'm gonna multiply by 7641, subtract 41293, It'll be a negative value. I have negative mu there, so I divide by negative one. I come out with 25678.95. All right, and if we go back here, 25,678. Okay, so our closest one is right there. So A is our best choice for that problem. Number 10, moving right along. Okay, number 10, a congressman mails a Questionnaire two, his constituents. His constituents are like his work friends. Okay, those are the people he works with. Asking if the U.S. should use military force to overthrow violent dictators in controversial areas of the world. Of the 500 people who respond, okay, that means he sent out more than 500, so this has a lot of problems. I would like to know, you know, what percent is 500? Does this, does this, um, study from non-response bias, where he didn't get a lot of responses back. He got 500 back, okay? So we don't know the total he sent out, but 35% of those people believe the U.S. should use force in this situation. On a talk show, the politician claims that only 35% of his constituents with a 4% margin of error believe in using military force, which is something for assumption, excuse me, for consecutive a confidence interval is violated, okay? All right, the population is 10 times as large as the sample. I don't know for sure, but I assume that his sample of 500, that's a lot of people, but we assume that that's uh, 10 times larger. I can't be sure of that one, okay? The data constitute a simple random sample. Okay, that's usually the problem. That's the problem here. The data is not a random sample. These are his friends and workmates, okay? They're not a good uh, random sample. And apparently there are a lot of these people for his constituents if it's less than 10% of 500, if 500 is less than 10% of the total, that means there's over 5,000, and he only has a little bit left there, okay? Um, N times P is 10 or more, it should be, all right, so that's not a problem. And the counter failure is N times Q is 10 or more, that's again what it should be, and that'd be okay as well, and there are no violating. So random sample is the most prominent problem in this particular problem, and that is typically the case for these types of problems. This is asked pretty frequently, and typically random sample is your answer. So I believe that's number 10. Number 10, there you go. Thank you again, guys.